How many of you all may have been in you know, New York in the 50s and 60s? Anybody? A few people? So ah, a fair amount of people. So I, I think that the art world at that point, particularly in New York, was really a few square blocks in Soho. It extended up to 57th Street and it had some other opportunities. But there was very little opportunity, truly, for artists to sell their art. In the um, play, it was interesting to hear them use the word commodification. And commodification, really, within the 20 years after Rothko, became the notion that the work of art itself was commodified and actually became a marketable item. And I think that's the biggest difference, that he's right at that period, and really pop art becomes the truly most commodified object itself, because the essence of pop art was about commodifying American culture. But ironically, probably the first artist to be truly commodified was Jackson Pollock. And placing him on the cover of Life magazine and traveling him all over the world, because what I think took place after World War II was the hegemony of the art world moved from Paris to New York. Uh -huh. And the art world really before World War II was in Europe and in Paris. And after World War II, it all comes really to New York. And that's the beginning of having all these great artists all over New York in this concentration <laughs> of artists, which then bloomed an art market to a certain extent. That's great. So I'm going to keep looking out here. So if you all have questions, please join in. Please raise your hand. Um, so in this play, Rothko also rants um, pretty royally about um, art critics, about gallery owners, yeah. about museums, about how, you know that they're hanging Andy Warhol next to Mark Rothko. Um, so as somebody running a major institution yeah. and something with n that is nationally acclaimed, what is it like when you're dealing, one, with an artist, and two, uh, the viewing public, and how do you determine what should be on those walls? It's still really hard, and there's no doubt the Rothko rant could be a studio in East End today. If we do our biennial and an artist is for some reason not chosen, or an artist who's chosen because they're so progressive, the rant comes from all parts of the art world. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, the wonderful thing about the art world is it is such an ecology, and we're really fortunate in a small city, I think actually like Portland, to have Maine College of Art, Space Gallery, us, SALT, the galleries around. We kind of have a microcosm of the greater art world within about 25 blocks, including the studio building and artists in the East End and the West End. And I think that there's an interesting notion um, how do we choose art or what do we not choose? And it really is a constant dialogue between the artists making the work, the galleries who often show it first, the alternative space that's picking up the progressive work, and then the museum which kind of puts its stamp of approval on that work itself. And so each of us have a different location in that ecological system, but a lot of time our audiences want each of those specimens to do something that the other one does. But we actually all have different roles, and I think Portland's extremely fortunate to have all of those roles. And I also think um, having Anita here in the symphony, we're incredibly fortunate to have not just a visual art kind of ecology, but an incredibly artistic um, community, which I think adds to the value of the experiences that we have. But in terms of picking art, there is really absolutely no formula. The only vague formula that I would suggest in a museum, which is different from what you might buy for your home, is we really do look at a work of art and try to say, in 25 years, will this work of art resonate with the next generation? Will someone, even if they don't love how it's presented or painted, will they think it actually tells us something about the period in which it was painted or made? And there was a comment that in the play, where he said something about it no longer is art temporal, no longer is it of the kind of moment. And one of the things uh, Anita offered me was a vision of, not a vision, but what's the new ism? Because he keeps getting mad at the next ism. And I read recently something about something I think is called post-temporal, that in visual art, we're actually in a period where there is no more time period. We're so darn confused that we're thinking about the future, the past, and the present, and conflating it into a single moment, which is really why a lot of contemporary art is confusing a lot of audiences, because in many ways, I think the artists are in a moment where they're trying to figure out what actually they're making. Yeah, up and back. Someone's got to give me a hard time on that. I mean, come on. <laughs> I threw that way out there, we'll so see please. If Dan does. <laughs>
the question is really about, about the use of projection. And we do use projection in here. I've actually done something which is fairly different from anything that's been done to date. Um, and and most, most of the sets are really set it fully in the studio. And I've mirrored that, but, but the, the red is, it's, it's trying to, the, the sides, it's trying to set him inside basically one of his paintings, but then using that as walls. So that sort of shifted that. And we opted to use all of that sort of intense color in transitions as opposed to in the middle of the piece, because what we didn't want to do was pull away from the, the intensity of the relationship between the artists. There was one point where with, um, um, when um, Ken is talking about his parents and the, the white, um, we had tried to increase the intensity on um, the, w the wall that they had just painted behind him. And because of the way that, that the projector works, it pixelates um, um, stuff, so he suddenly had all these dots all over him. And so, well, it was, it was a great, it was an interesting idea, it was my idea. Um, but it, it was a great idea, but it, it, totally, it, it totally drew away from what they were doing, and that's, so it's, it's our, the equipment that we have won't quite let us do exactly what you're saying, but, but it's, it's certainly something that we talked about. Um, and maybe we should have gone further um, in that direction with things. I'm a bit confused about this uh, art for art's sake, and then so at the end of the 50s, suddenly things went more commercial, whatever. I mean, if, if you go back to the, you know, the, 15th century or whatever, I mean, painters always were buying for commissions, and I'm sure they had to bend their wishes a little bit to paint for the prince or the king or whatever they wanted. I'm, I'm just wondering if that was a, uh, a delusion on the part of Rothko to think, to think that he did art for art's sake, and then the world became corrupted. I mean, hasn't it always been a little corrupted? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I think you're actually absolutely right. I mean, the, the difference would be at a certain point, Rothko had financial freedom at this point in his life, and he could make those choices. Many of the artists in the 15th century, if you were given a commission and you turned down a major commission, you might not ever get another one. And they really were at the will of the church and the royals, however you want to put it, for those commissions. And then you're absolutely right, there really wasn't a great deal of freedom. The real freedom was in the virtuoso of how they painted, but they were really painting into a very strict of what they could paint for a very specific site. So it's interesting that he's finding himself in this location. I mean, my feeling would be if Philip Johnson and Mies van der Rohe ask you to do anything, you probably should just do it. Um, I mean, many of you may have been the Four Seasons, and I understand the commodification of that element, but to me, the magic of that commission is actually the sequence building is one of my favorite buildings in the world is the possibility of having this major commission in one of the most important you know, examples of modernist architecture, certainly in New York City. But I think you're absolutely right. But you also understand, I mean, it, how are you viewing the art if you're really viewing your, your dinner? And, and he didn't really think that through before taking the commission. But again, most of those great paintings are sitting on Park Avenue in people's apartments anyway. So it's mm -hmm. the people who are eating at the Four Seasons are the same people who are buying at Castelli. And so <laughs> I'm not quite sure where he's going. Yeah, over here. Hey, he talks with such glee of having taken out uh, Picasso. So clearly he came in, didn't want to paint in the style of Picasso, wanted to paint his own style, came in and created a whole new genre. Now the same thing's happening to him with the, the pop art. So you can see that that style. And if you think about, I, you know the, the images that he painted, but you don't know much about him. Whereas you know a lot about the painters that were famous in the 60s right. and 70s, where it became more personality driven, or more public figure. Well, he, you, I mean, I mean, thinking of, he, he was definitely a philosopher. I mean, there's no question. Yeah, and he started in a figurative style. He started, um, 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 Emma, who's out there, it was the, the um, directing assistant, and she did a whole mural of, of um, his style, what was happening in, in the United States, and what he was doing throughout his career. And it started very much um, just, uh, it looked like it could be Picasso. And then he gradually developed this particular style this color block um, sensibility, and uh, so, and, and I think like he he was looking to be to be somebody famous. He was, in, but I think he was also a very tortured human being. 
there's this giant tome of a book, which is the quintessential um, biography of Rothko. And um, his life was not very easy. And in fact, with a lot of the paintings, um, um, he, he killed himself. Um, so the whole, the Ken imagery that you get of, um, you know, both the end of, with him, with the paint on his arms is really foreshadowing what he actually did do. Um, but then Ken with his parents, um, Rothko had two kids, a boy and a girl, and the boy was six when he committed suicide. Um, and the daughter actually lost control of all the artwork um, to the yeah, Marlboro, Mar Mar Marlboro Gallery. Um, gallery, which was then um, making deals around the side so that they were getting a lot of the paintings for very little. And she and her brother, she was 19, and, and the two of them um, sued to get control, and they, they sort of surprisingly to everybody won um, that, that whole thing. But that was a huge, tremendous shock, and she's held on to her father's work rather than trying to sell it off. She just wants basically what she said is I want, I want Rothko with me. Um, so that's not her father directly, but it is his, her, her, she's her father's daughter. If you want to go thinking about how art really entered into the corporate world, not the private office of a private person, you really have to go back to David Rockefeller and Chase Manhattan Bank. Mm -hmm. The real first corporate art program, David said something, not David that I know, David Rockefeller, but David Rockefeller found, it was like art and work were combined and that all the spaces within Chase Manhattan Bank needed to have culture as part of the very identity branding of Chase Manhattan Bank. And so they actually created their own art program. And over time, what you found is more and more corporations wanting to participate in that high wealth management, which also has a lot to do with art and culture, then had to have their own private collectors or private curators within those banks that make purchases. And so it's trickled down from having you know, high, high-end professionals to small organizations like hotels, which often will hire a the new hotels in town quite often will hire local gallerists or curators to purchase works of art for, the, for, their, for their hotels. So it's usually purchased by a certain person within the organization. The Seagram murals were, were sort of towards the end, the latter part of his career. Um, um, so it, I, I'm not sure exactly what you, this was in the 50s, and he died in 69, Am I, is that right? 70. So, so towards the end, and this whole notion of black seeping in, and maybe yep. you're, you're probably better, you can speak to the art of well, it. Well, part of the most interesting part about this moment, I think it's 58-ish, that this is taking place. It's, not so, it's soon after that um, Rothko has three incredible opportunities, and which many of you may have experienced, um, which is the Phillips Gallery in Washington they commissioned him to do pieces for a very specific room. And a lot of ways, what's really interesting is now today, installation art and environments are very popular. That space, it's Phillips Gallery in that little museum was one of the first real installations where a room itself was set up to look exactly as he wanted to be with those paintings in which you went into an environment and there was an aura. And that also took place, ironically, in actually the faculty lounge at Harvard in 62. He did let a commission go through, and those paintings are actually on view at the New Fog if you get a chance. So I would do that. The other most probably one of the, for me, heart-wrenching in a positive way is the Rothko Chapel in Houston. And the Rothko Chapel, again, eventually I think he got what he really wanted. And he, it's referenced in the play, I think, and it's looking into the future. The Rothko Chapel really is the moment where it wasn't really the um, altar of commerce. It was the altar of religion. And I think that space, he felt very comfortable placing his work of art. And if you get a chance, that's a wonderful space. The other one is really in the Tate. The Tate Modern has an incredible, incredible um, Rothko room. And it really is what he talks about here. He hasn't quite realized. So to hear this conversation early about what's going to really happen, and in many ways, those rooms will probably be the most lasting legacy of his work as much as any single painting. Yeah. Uh, have you ever thought about using Seagram's whiskey as uh, <laughs> part of the... Uh... As, as, as part of the... That's a really, that's a very smart idea. No, that had never <laughs> occurred to me. 
to use Seagram's whiskey, and we should, we should be selling it at the, at, at the, at the bar in, in advance so everybody can drown their sorrows. So for those, could everybody hear back there? Um, um, he's really saying that this play impacted him, and hearing all this discussion and seeing this play makes him want to go back to the gallery and sit with the chair and really contemplate the work. It, it's also interesting, just one sec, is that um, today, particularly for younger people, they forget how much of a political act it was to make an abstract painting. Um, a lot of young folks just don't look at abstract painting the way some folks who are older who went through the process in which abstract expressionism had to come into the environment and also color field painting. That the very act was a modernist act against the past about the future. And today a lot of folks look at an abstract painting because there's so many bad abstract paintings that we see over and over again the great abstract paintings, that whole message that they projected, I think, particularly in the 40s and 50s, has been incredibly diluted. And Rothko actually is one of the few painters I find younger folks who get into those spaces, and it's one of the moments where they go, I get it, like I get abstraction. Kandinsky can do that for some people, but Rothko is one of those few people that I think transcends that particular moment where you have an understanding that his hunt for the spiritual is actually a political gesture. What is the tie-in then between abstract and communism? What's the, the tie-in? Tie-in between abstract expressionism and communism. I think it's the environment in New York at that time and a lot of intellectuals, particularly after World War II, and a lot of folks were coming from Europe and there was a lot of people teaching in the schools at that moment about a radical change. And I think it's really about timing, not necessarily that communism and abstract expressionism had to be tied with each other. There were a lot of American realists in the 1920s in New York who were actually really socialist, probably much more than, much more card-carrying socialist in New York in the 20s than they were in the 50s and 60s when it was a bit more, uh, dare I say, vogue to be communist um, rather than the 20s when it was much more of a political moment. I, don't, I wouldn't put too much into it. I think it was the moment. And you probably found within, you know, after Stalinism and Maoism, pretty quickly when people realized what was taking place, most of those abstract expressionists that were engaged in that thought process may have spiritually been thinking about the notion of the positivity of communism, but were certainly distancing themselves. Does that help? I'm going to go over here and then over that way. I'm not sure it's possible, anybody? And Red, remember red the Diaper Babies, it's a book. <clears throat> the dialogue in this was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Do you know on what, how the playwright went about creating that dialogue? Well, I think a lot of it, a lot of it is actually Rothko's words. There, um, there, there, there is this, this biography that I, I mentioned has a lot of quotes by him, and so a lot of what Rothko is saying in the play are things that Rothko actually did say. Um, and I think those are some of the strongest parts of the dialogue, but yeah. He wrote a lot, too. <laughs> I was wondering what happened to the Seagram bureaus? <laughs> I think eventually they were, they're, he they're, sold them. That they're they, at the Tate, yeah. they're, they're all over the place, so they, so they still are around. Um, there are a number of them that are together um, in, in different places. Yes, we've been working with Mecca, and um, I'm not sure if all of them are coming, but a huge swath of them are coming. Um, so it's, it's a fabulous way to connect with them. And I think it's not just Rothko, but there's a lot of other discussion that he has about other painters and other styles. So I think it's just a way of opening up that whole world. One of the things that we, uh, contractually, these have to right. be destroyed. Um, at the end of the play, anything that looks remotely like him, um, that was part of what we had to say that we would do, so that we're not um, going into um, counterfeiting Rothko's here at Portland Stage. It's a good plan. <laughs> yeah. In your notes, you mentioned that uh, a lot of the paintings are deteriorating, uh, and you said that the color was, was blanking out, but because of cheap materials, uh, why would he be using inferior stuff? 
You know, I, I, I don't know enough about the conservation side, but there's no doubt most of the abstract expressionists and even some of the color field painters were just buying bad house paint. And it really is a conservator's nightmare over time. A lot of those paintings are changing over, over time, unlike traditionally made paints or paints you usually would be painting with. There was something about using ready-to-use paint that was part of the kind of progressive nature of stomping out the old painters. The Picasso paintings, which are made from beautiful paint, will outlast many, many of the younger paintings that knocked him out because he knew how to mix paint. House paint was a big problem, and they also often weren't actually um, treating their canvases before they built up the paint. So even the whole notion of how you build up a canvas to make it last long is a real problem. The ones at Harvard, though, um, that they did, they actually had them at too much light. There was just too much light in the room, and it killed the paintings. They lost about 40% of their luster. So, and it is interesting that now they're doing what we are doing on the upper part. They're using projections to right. put that luster back in. So when you go, it looks the way it was intended to look. Mm -hmm. I know that you talked about Mecca, but what are you doing to get more young people here to see this show and talk about it? Are you working with schools? Um, we do. We work with all of the Portland public schools, and um, we're out in schools. We're, we have early shows. I think we have two early shows, which are student matinees for this show, um, for this production. Um, so young people will come and see it. We also have a new Rush 35 program, so that it's it's ten dollars. You can come see a show. Can bring a friend, um, and we're finding that we've gone from having 12 members of that to 100. And if you know people under 35 that you want to suggest this to, we'd love to have them here and and filling seats. It's an and important thing. Not that I'm trying to fundraise, but um, one of the things that's very difficult, particularly for um, the symphony or the museum or the stage, is to know. Well, first, I want to assure you that our very essence of what we want to do is to get young people and to be part of a learning opportunity. The hardest part in a town this small is having enough money to do what we do professionally and then to take that, what we do professionally, to other audiences. And if you want to think about the ways in which you can help, um, particularly the arts in Portland and in Maine, move beyond you know, a wonderful Portland stage or the Portland Museum of Art, help us out with education. One thing we do is something called Culture Club in which we try our best actually as organizations so we're not overlapping with each other. We try to put resources together to get as many kids into our programs as possible. But please get the word out. There's no doubt we would love to have more and more younger people at all of our events. It's, it's not easy and we need help because partially getting the schools in, we discount our tickets to the point where actually we're losing money. And as nonprofits running in this community or in this environment right now, we can break even, but we really can't lose money. And we will not have an audience if we don't have young people and it's not a learning environment. So, so please do, if there's any ways to um, support any of us in those ways, please do. Sorry. No, you're absolutely, <laughs> everything that he says. <laughs> yes, sir. You mentioned a biography, which is quintessential. Do you have the biographer's name or the title of the biography? Emma, you're gonna. Breslin. 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 B -R -E B-R-E-S-L-I-N, and it's called Rothko, and it's a big, fat thing. It's, it's a great book. Most everybody, um, um, the, the director and the actors have read, read through the whole thing. Took a while. Yes? Was there, in fact, an assistant who was with him for a couple of years and who strongly disagreed with him, or is that a dramatic device? Again, Emma, I'm going to point to you. Yeah, he had assistants. Um, their relationships aren't really well documented, so a lot of the dialogue is fictionalized. And a lot of it, I think, exists to get to these more interesting conversations about the art. But they definitely did have several assistants, actually, from this point. This was the first commission that he took on an assistant, and then he had various assistants up to his death. So, and uh, one last question. How many times did you practice painting that <laughs> with the music so it came out exactly? Uh, that, that was uh, getting the right um, consistency of paint, teaching um, actors who are not painters how to hold a brush. Um, that took, they started in the first week of rehearsal and came in and did it a couple of times in the shop and then getting it moving with, with the, um, 
music was was a huge thing. The other the other dilemma with that is that as as they're painting, they're also sizing the canvas. And because what Rothko was doing is, um, uh, Mark alluded to the fact that painters weren't they were sort of applying the pigment to a canvas that wasn't properly sized. So he was painting on raw muslin on raw canvas. Um, and what happens is it tightens up so the whole frame starts to bend and warp because we haven't built it. It's out of, of, of pine. It's not, it's not a hardwood. So it, it actually took a lot. There's a whole little bracket thing that's attached to there to keep that painting so it doesn't start to move because we would do it and the whole painting would start to warp and twist and you'd end up with sort of the ski slope. You so it, 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 it was quite a, a feat to figure out how to do it and how to do it so we didn't end up with um, six gallons of paint on the floor. <laughs> what makes a good abstract painter? It's the eye of the beholder. <laughs> eye of the beholder. So I'm actually, It's really hard. I, I'm actually gonna ask Mark one more in oh. the same vein, and that's what is red to you? Wow. Uh, red's my favorite color, so that's pretty easy. Um, I think first with fire engines. I you know just as a little kid seeing fire engines and I just love the color red. And professionally the red's become important to me because it was interesting he listed all the artists. Red is probably the most difficult. I see red over here. Um, red here, red here, red there, red there, red there, red. Red is the single color that a, a, a visual artist puts into a canvas. Your eye goes to red immediately. You have to be incredibly brave as an artist to use the color red because inherently it takes the attention away from everything else. The Portland Museum of Art color is red partially because Winslow Homer is one of the most important painters who used red. He did not use red like this, but if you look at whether it's the blood on a fish, it's the red on a Civil War cap, or wherever it may be in the canvas, he was able to use red to add a certain essence to the painting that changes the whole painting. And if you use red incorrectly, it can ruin the painting. And so it's really a gesture of red, I think is the ultimate kind of artistic gesture. So to have this be red is, is a perfect, and ending on the red is fabulous. <laughs> Thank you.